This morning, uh, we're continuing on, and, and this is really, I want to share my heart uh, with you this morning on, last week we talked of bringing healing to a broken world. If you didn't get a chance to hear the message, I uh, just want to encourage you to go and, and listen to it or watch it on YouTube. I believe it'll encourage you and bring even more context into this morning. But I think we can all agree, aren't you thankful of how Jesus has healed your heart, how he's healed your life, that you have purpose? And that's why we're here this morning, is because Jesus has done something in our life. And it's amazing when you think of all the different seasons we go through as people or that we experience in life, he is always there. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. I don't know about you, but I think that you would agree that when you get the revelation or the realization that, as we talked of last week, when you're in that tough place, that when you have an understanding that he's with you, that his love is there for you, that it lights up every area of your life, that it gives you assurance that your life isn't going to fall apart or that you have purpose in your life. And so this morning, I want to uh, continue on of, of what it, it looks like to bring healing into a broken world. Again, last week we talked of that when we come into the church or we come into relationship with Christ, we begin to become discipled. We begin to understand what it means to follow Christ. And then as we're going up the journey up the mountain and then on our way back down, as God has healed us, as he's delivered us, as he's redeemed us, we've experienced the blood of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit in our life, then this is where purpose and mission comes in. Then he sends us out. It's like almost when you walk into the church, it's a revolving door. You come in, you get discipled, you get filled, and then it sends you right back out to go and heal the world around us, to bring healing to the, bro the brokenness in our lives, and then to go into our families, into our workplace, those are neighbors, people that need healing. You know, I think of uh, a story that really touched me, and you might have heard it on the news, it made national news, but there was a young boy by the name of Gabriel in Cincinnati in a middle school, and uh, you might have seen the story or the headlines, but this is just the kind of brokenness that our world has, and it's not, all we have to do is turn on the news to say there's brokenness. I think we can all agree that the world is broken and needs hope, and it's not going to be a politician, it's not going to be a policy, it's going to be the power of God, and because that's getting to the, the root issue of everything that our world needs Jesus, and God has called us to go and be the answer. So there was, there's this boy, you might have seen it, where he was an eight-year-old boy, and he uh, was walking down the hall, and he saw some of, uh, one of his friends being bullied by some older students. And so footage of the incident was released, and what had happened is uh, this little boy goes in to try to, to help uh, the other kids that were being, the other child that was being bullied. So as he goes in, these kids see him, sock him out, and this boy goes down. So he's trying to do a right thing, trying to do a good thing to intervene to stop the bullying that's happening in his school. So Gabriel gets knocked out, and this is the heart-wrenching thing that you see to happen throughout this situation. As he is knocked out on the ground, uh, the boys that were being bullied just start laughing at him, and then for over, I think, six or seven minutes it was, he, lay, he laid passed out on the ground while all of his students, teachers were walking by, no one saw him, and here he is, down and out. He was just bullied, this eight-year-old boy. And so finally, you can see in the footage that right behind the bathroom door, there was a teacher on the other side, and someone finally had the courage and the guts to go and get a teacher and say, hey, the, w Gabriel is passed out, what do we do? And what we see happen and how the school decided to handle it, they tried to go along the, the path that it wasn't a bullied situation because then they would be held liable and there would be consequences. Because what we see through this story and what we have to deal with is that when we see a, a situation that's broken, a lot of the times the process that goes on to our head, if I step into this, that I'm kind of putting, putting my comfort out, I'm putting myself out there in order to bring healing to a situation. And so... Here's the tragic part of the story, because no one intervened, and they told that he had just had a, uh, something wrong with him and passed out, and so the, the family, the mother, those that could do something about it, because they didn't know what the issue was, she sent him to the doctor to take care of what they thought was a bloody nose, and, but never really got to get, get to the core issue of that, what he was dealing with, that I was just bullied, I was just took to the ground and the feelings and the things that he was dealing with. So this is how he decides to deal with it because no one was there to help him. The tragic story, the tragedy of it is 
two days later, his mother walks into the young boy's room and they had saw that he had taken a tie and he hung himself. An eight-year-old boy. Because of what he was, the bullying and the things that he was dealing with. And when I saw that, it's, God, where was somebody? Where was someone to go and intervene into the situation to bring healing to this young boy? Why didn't the school do something about it? And we have to see that this is the world we live in, that an eight-year-old boy, first of all, would even know how to do something like that to even take his own life. Now more than ever, our world needs healing. And God has placed healing in our hands, in your hands, to go and bring into the world in whatever situation that looks like with all the things that our world deals with. It's easy just to, well, I feel I can't make a difference in that or I don't know what to do in that situation, so it's easy just to kind of back off and someone else will deal with it. Have you ever been there where you're like, someone else will deal with it? You know, we, we pay people, we pay, pay our taxes, so someone else will deal with it. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning and I'm here to tell myself that God has called us to deal with it. God has put solutions in our hands to bring healing to a broken world. You know, I think one of the things that is tough, why we don't see the church doing what God designed the church to do, if you look at statistics, uh, and this is kind of crazy because our world and, and our community should be different, but if you go and you look at statistics, what the statistics will say is that 84% of Americans consider themselves Christians. If we had 84% of Americans being Christians, wouldn't you say our world would be a little different? But I think the disconnect of what we see, and, and again, this, what they asked, they went to people and said, hey, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And they would say, yeah, I believe that. But really where the nitty-gritty and the rubber hits the road and where things start to change is when you take what you believe and you turn it into action, or you start pursuing what it means to go after God or live for Christ. And so we have a world that says that they love God or has an idea of who they think God is or what God requires of them or what God has drawn them into to be a part of, that if those 84% of people say that they're Christians, then they would understand that they need to bring healing to a broken world. Because last week we looked that Jesus commissioned his apostles, his disciples, and then he commissioned the 70 to go and what? Preach the kingdom of God and bring healing. And so if we live this out, the world around us would begin to change. But it usually takes putting ourselves out on the line and trusting God, getting out of our comfort zone and believing that he's going to put what we need right in our hands. And I'm here to encourage you this morning, let's get, off of our, let's get out of our bubbles. Let's get out of our comfort zone and start believing God that he can bring healing in a broken world. You know, if you were to ask Jesus, you know, Jesus, what, what is it that you want? What do you want from my life? What is it when I look at your word? What did you want from people when you approached them or when you encountered them or you invited them into a relationship? And what you can see story after story after story is that Jesus always wanted to change and transform lives. You look at the disciples and the apostles. They were going a certain path, right? They were fishermen. They had trades. They did different things. Jesus is like, okay, that's great that you're doing that, but I want to completely change you and send you in a whole different direction. We've been talking a lot about the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. When she encountered Jesus, we know the story, she ran back into her town, told everyone about it, and her life changed. The, the path and the direction, the adultery that she was in, she experienced the healing touch of God and her brokenness and everything in her world started to change, and then she wanted to go in to everyone's world and change that. Because when you experience the power of God, when you experience salvation, which a lot of us can say that we have, you just don't stay in a place, right? You want to go and you want to bring healing into people's life. You want to go and you want to tell people that you don't have to stay in your pit, that you don't have to stay in your mess. There is answers. You, you can experience Jesus. You can experience love, relationship. The fruits of his spirit can heal and touch your life. You know, another, another person I think about is the rich young ruler. If you've ever read the story, you know that he was very well off. He had everything taken care of. He, uh, you know, obviously the story is the rich young ruler. So he had riches. He had wealth. And he knew the, the law. He knew what the commandments were.
But here's when the rubber hits the road, which we all have the situation, the very thing that we grip on to the Titus, that's usually what Jesus calls us to release because that's the thing that grips us and that's the thing that blocks us from having his presence and his purpose in our lives. And so the rich young ruler, it says as you go and you read the story in Luke 19, that when Jesus said, he said, what must I do to follow you? What must I do to be a Christian? What must I do to align my confession and really walk out my faith? If you know the story, he said, Jesus said to the man, you have to go and you have to sell everything. Give all your riches away. And the very next verse, it says, he was full of sorrow. And he was sad that this is what it took, that what Jesus was requiring of him. And I think all of us come to moments when we say, we worship and we go before God, that we want his presence in our life. We want to be sold out for Jesus. We want our lives to be consumed by his presence we want our families to change. We want our marriages to change. And then when Jesus gives the word, that's when we're, ooh, I don't know if I can do that, Jesus. Like Brianna talked about in her struggle message, we love the idea of God changing our circumstance, but we struggle with the idea of God changing us. That's where it gets tough. And that's what we're, we were seeing in, with the rich young ruler. That God wasn't just wanting to take a circumstance and say, okay, go in and give 10% here. And the rich young ruler, okay, yeah, I can do that. He was saying, I want you to sell everything. This is what I'm calling you to do. Another story I think about is the story of Zacchaeus, which is uh, the rich young ruler was Luke 18, actually. And then Luke 19 is the story of Zacchaeus, who was the corrupt tax collector. And he would cheat people of their money. And you know the story that he was a man of short stature. And when he saw Jesus was in the town... Zacchaeus climbs up on a tree to see where Jesus is at. And Timmy, if you want to put our scripture up, I want to uh, read through uh, the story of Zacchaeus real quick. Uh, But I want you to look at this. So here's kind of the story of what took place. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and he came down and he received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained and saying, he has gone to be with a guest, with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, 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 I give half my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he, is also, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. <coughs> What we see here is a story of when Zacchaeus encountered Jesus, you saw a reaction, which when we encounter Jesus, we never stay the same. When Jesus came to all four of those people I just shared, he wanted them to change. He didn't want them just to stay in the lifestyle and the things they were doing. Jesus desired for them to change, but what was the cool thing is they wanted to change. It wasn't Jesus didn't have to beg them to change. Jesus never begs us to change. Jesus invites us to be changed. And so I think we can tell with Zacchaeus, because this is what sin does, when we're in a pattern of sin, in his case, he was cheating people, he was a corrupt tax collector, what started to happen, you can imagine that Zacchaeus, the the pressure and the guilt and all the things that sin does and the overwhelmingness, and he started to say, I know what I'm, he caught up to him, I know what I'm doing probably isn't right, and something needs to change. And so when he goes and climbs in a sycamore tree, which in that time a man of his stature would never do, because that was considered, you know, if you're rich or if you're of a certain status, you don't climb, someone else will climb for you and go get Jesus' attention. But this is how desperate Zacchaeus was. But what I love and what we see through this story is because when Zacchaeus encountered Christ, something changed inside of him, and then look what happened. He went and he took all of his wealth and his riches, and he gave it back. There was a reaction to what Christ had done inside of him privately. Something public took place. 
Because of a lot of us, we love the idea of just a private faith. This is what I do, but don't make me take it out and don't, God, don't require something of me. That would be too easy. But with Zacchaeus, something changed so radically inside of him that he gave back fourfold of what he had stolen and what he had taken. And this is what the rhythm that we should be in our relationship with God. When we feel that we've sinned or we fall short, we go before God and then we make things right. Or we go and we allow God to heal us, then we bring healing into that situation. Because you can say you have a boss or someone that you just have had it up to here. And you storm into his office, you chew him out, you cuss him out, you forget you're even saved. And then you storm back out of there and you, you, you made your peace there. And then a few weeks later, you start to feel as Zacchaeus did, well, maybe what I did was wrong or maybe something needs to change here. So you go to Jesus, you pray and you ask for forgiveness. You feel that forgiveness, but it just doesn't stop there, right? Usually what God would require us to do is take the humble walk back to that boss and apologize, say, what I did was wrong. Will you please forgive me? That is what restoration looks like in our lives. And so Zacchaeus, you can tell that when he walked back into the town and he went to people that he had cheated and that he had stolen from, I can tell you they had probably a couple words for when they saw Zacchaeus again. But look, when Zacchaeus entered the homes and went to the people that he had cheated, stolen from, he went to restore back. Now, to me, that's a sign of someone who's been changed and who's been transformed. Because our flesh never tells us to go back into a situation that we lost our cool and to go and make it right. But that's bringing healing back into that situation. So that's what I want us to grab hold of this morning. And that's what I want us to look at, is that we know what Scripture says in James, that faith without works is what? Faith without works is what? It's dead. It's not dormant. It's not so-so. It is dead. It's a capital D-E-A-D, dead. So if you have faith or if you have a belief, just as 84% of America says that they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, okay, well, where's the works at? Because if you just believe, but if you don't live according to the word of God, or if you don't desire to go after Christ, then your faith isn't dead, or your your faith isn't authentic, or it's not full. And so that's what we see whenever Jesus encountered people, or whenever he went into people's homes. They always wanted to, change always took place. But you know, there's a disease that I think keeps us from this, and that's uh, just simply the disease of self, selfishness. We were talking about it in prayer this morning. Is selfishness keeps us from really experiencing all that God has for us because Christ was the most selfless person to ever live. And you and I, Scripture says, are the body of Christ. And so if Nikki's the body of Christ, if Steve's the body of Christ, if Jeff is the body of Christ, Loretta is the body of Christ. All of us are the body of Christ. We're to be like Christ. And what did the body of Christ do? He gave himself for the world. He took a cross in order for healing to take place. And so if we're the body of Christ and how we see healing take place and how love is really seen, because the world has an idea of love, But how love and healing is brought forth is always through a cross. There's always a moment that we have to ask ourselves, God, what are you calling me to sacrifice? What are you calling me, as we talked of being in this place last week, you might be calling me to stay in this place and experience long suffering because you're what you're wanting to do inside of me. You know, Mark 2.22 says, we've heard this scripture before, it says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, and the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. Kind of say this a little different and bring it up to where, where at least I can understand. And I've always wondered, what does that mean? Or what was that talking about? You get the gist of the idea, but 
Imagine that you, go, you open your refrigerator and you see the date on your milk has expired. What are you going to do? You're going to take it over, you're going to turn your grinder on because there's probably some chunks in it, and you're going to start pouring it down your sink. Now, what you wouldn't do when you saw it was, and you bring the new milk in, you might see, okay, the milk has expired, but maybe I can just drink a glass of the new milk, and then I don't want to waste the milk, so I'm going to pour it in the new container, right? You don't do that. You get rid of the milk, and you put the new milk in your refrigerator, and you don't mix the two. What this is saying here is when you come and you experience healing and you want Jesus to transform your life, the old way you thought, the old way you did things, your old man, your old flesh, you can't pour the new into that. It's got to change. You got to, to, to allow Christ to heal it and then allow the new wine or the new milk to be poured into your life. Where a lot of us, we never want to allow that process to happen. We want to take an old way of thinking. What was the biggest thing with the Israelites that God was trying to heal? He was trying to get Egypt out of them while they were in the wilderness. That was the healing place that God had for them. And the thing is, when you read God's word and you get the revelation of it, Jesus had high expectations for his followers. You never got the drift or the, the thing from Jesus. It's okay if you do, and it's okay if you don't. Scripture even says, and this is always the tough that just kind of blows your mind, he says, be holy as I am holy. Well, how the heck am I going to do that? You're God. You're Jesus. You are perfect. But what he desires for us is to always be striving to be holy as he is holy. To always be pursuing his heart and knowing what he's called us to do, knowing what his word is, to be holy as he is holy. You know, there's two things, I think, as disciples of Christ that we experience. And it goes along with James 2, 17 through 18, with faith without works is dead. There's always a personal transforming relationship with Christ. So when we come, we have a personal encounter with Christ. But then it always becomes public. Things, when you change personally or when you experience Christ or you get a revelation, it just doesn't stay there, but then something public in your life changes. For example, if you're married, this will, this will make some sense. When you get married, your life should change for the better, right? Right? Okay. Amen, Woody. When you get married and you make a confession to your spouse that I'm going to love and I'm going to cherish you through the good, through the bad, it just doesn't stay there, but that confession should turn public. That when you're out with your wife or you're out with your husband, you're not going to react to different ladies or to different men in public the way you did before you were married. Your life publicly changes. And so we have a lot of Christians which they never get to that place where it's, okay, I went to a, a youth rally or I had a moment where in a church service once where I said that Jesus is Lord, but then they've never understood the healing journey to heal brokenness in their life and then to revolve them out the door and go bring healing into a broken world. What I'm trying to get you to grab hold of is we had above here for many, many years expect winds of change. Expect it, because it always happens. Living a life with Christ is full of change. And you, and then going and bringing change into the world. You know, someone who's really inspired me of how they've brought healing to a broken world is my beautiful great aunt Carol and Uncle Mike. You know, I think about them of, of how they're raising three grandchildren. How old are Skylar and Chris Carroll? Six and three, and then Tristan is 17, almost 18. And so they decided after praying and, and, and God dealing with them to go and, and get their grandchildren and how they've been living with you and you've been raising them, and it hasn't been easy. You have a broken ankle right now. But you guys have had a heart for your grandchildren that God has called you to go and be the body of Christ in that situation to bring healing into your grandchildren's life. 
And I honor you for that because it takes long suffering. It's not easy getting the kids up, getting them here to church. You've responded to that and you're bringing healing into their lives. And I want to encourage you this morning that God is using you to show your grandchildren who God is. That everything you do, God has completely changed their, your grandchildren's situation because you were willing to do this. There was brokenness and you decided we're going to bring healing. And so stay encouraged that God is using you mightily in the life of your grandchildren. And as we were talking this morning, give, her, give him a hand. We love you. But that's with all of us. We're all fighting battles that no one has any idea about. And as we were talking this morning in prayer, we're a little bit more kind with each other when we understand that I'm fighting a battle and Woody's fighting a battle that I know nothing about. Struggling to become a Bengals fan. I think that's your battle, but <laughs> I don't blame you. I wouldn't want to be one either. But we all have battles that we're fighting through that nobody knows nothing about. So again, faith without works is dead. You read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Beatitudes, when Jesus did his Sermon on the Mount, which is known as the constitution of Christianity. That These are values, morals, things that Jesus revealed of how we're to be as Christians. And as I was reading and studying, there was a, a church father in the early church centuries that said, and this is a, a, a tough thing to realize, and this should put motivation within us. He said that hell will be full of people who thought lightly of the Sermon on the Mount. So the commands of Jesus, the way that he's called us to bring healing to a broken world, sometimes we just read through it and we're just like, oh, that's, that sounded really good, but we never do anything with it. What are you doing with your faith? What are you doing with your relationship with Christ? And again, I'm preaching to myself. Hell will be full of people who thought lightly of the Sermon of the Mount. Jesus desires for us to go after the least of these. When you read, and this is what I want to look at, when you read Jesus' mission statement, when he went into the temple, opened the scroll, and revealed a prophecy that this is what I'm all about. And last week we looked at, he commissioned his followers to do the same. And if we're the body of Christ, this is our mission statement. This is our purpose in life as it was for Jesus. Look what scripture says, Luke 4, 18 through 21. Jesus opens the scroll and he says to everyone that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Look at all Jesus said. Was it really anything about him? But it was all that the Spirit of God is upon me to go and take faith and see it change people's lives, see it transform people's lives, see it heal people's lives. That those that are brokenhearted, those that are pure, those that are blind physically, spiritually, our world is blind to Christ. They're blind. They don't realize that God wants to heal their life. But he uses us because we're full of the Spirit of God and we're the body of Christ to go into open eyes, to use, use our mouths. Jesus commissioned us to go in to preach the gospel. Well, how, what, what is the best way to preach? And this is just so practical. We hear it all the time. But the best way to preach to somebody is to go and to love them. To go and to love them. The best way to heal a marriage is to go and to just love. The best way to heal relationships is to go and to love. That is how we preach. It's not, I got to put a 30-minute sermon together and I got to get all my notes and make sure I know my scriptures and then go and say, hey, you got 30 minutes so I can talk to you? <laughs> no, it's simply saying, hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee? And can we just talk about life? What's going on? And then you watch as God opens a door for you to bring Jesus to them, which is in result healing. 
Sometimes the gospel, people just overcomplicate it way too much. But it's so simple, and Jesus made it so simple and gave us such a, a simple focus to this is how you're to see change in the world. And as the church, this is what we're to grab and we're to run with and we're to see lives transformed. Again, it's not just something private that happens within us, but it translates into public. And we're to strive in every way we know how to bring this about. Tim, if you want to put this up on the screen, our quote from uh, a church mother at that, an early church mother in the 1500s or the 15th century, Teresa of Avila, this is what she said, and it's so beautiful. Read this. It says that Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Your hands, insert your name right there, your, you are the eyes through which his compassion looks out upon the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. I hope it's making sense now. That sometimes we just want to see a situation, okay, I'm going to pray for it. But this says, well, I've given you hands, I've given you a mouth, I've given you feet. Go be the body of Christ in that situation. It says it as plain as day. And that's what I'm wanting us to see and, and, and feel, that when we see a situation, that we just not go to our prayer closet and pray about it, because that's always the easy thing to do. I'm guilty of it. But that God may be requiring us to go be the hands, feet, eyes, and mouth, and to bring compassion, which as we talked of last week, compassion is long-suffering. That so many situations change, it's just not an overnight thing that, well, okay, I, I invited them out, took the, got them a cup of coffee, and got to hear their story, but that's not the end of it. You just don't leave that person there and say, good luck with life. Usually when they open up and share things with you, God might use you to say, hey, we're doing this series on healing into a broken world at our church. You need to come, and maybe God will speak to you. Or hey, you need to, to hang out with Woody and Entrell. They make Woody makes an amazing meal, and you need to get to know them, and they got a story they can share what they went through in New Orleans. You see how the body of Christ starts to work? But you just have to be willing to allow God to use your hands, your feet, your mouth, your eyes, and open up and allow your faith to become public. Go public with it. Get up off your feet. Get up off your behind and be the body of Christ. And again, I'm talking to myself. You know, to, to break it down even more, my Aunt Teresa, or even Michelle, you are amazing bakers and you make amazing desserts. If I were to ask Michelle, hey Michelle, can you bake me a cake? And she were to bake me a cake and I were to stick my fork into it and eat it and something didn't taste right, and then she told me, well, I took half the ingredients, ingredients out of that cake, that's why it doesn't taste good. That's what a lot of us do with our faith, is we've taken half of the ingredients out of what Christ calls us to do and that's why we feel stagnant or that's why we feel we're not growing because we, we don't understand that, yes, we're to be discipled as we're doing now, but then we're apostles and we're sent and we're, go, we're to go and to do this and to come alongside of people and, and, and get involved in people's lives. Re reject superficiality in your relationship with others and your relationship with Christ. But I will warn you, it can get messy Baking a cake is messy. If I baked a cake, it would be messy. <laughs> Michelle probably doesn't get any flour on her. She's a pro. <laughs> You're the messiest person. The messiest person. I don't believe that. You know, another way to even think about it is all these amazing instruments that we have up here and the beautiful worship that we had this morning. Christian could have played the drums. The piano could have been played. All the guitars could have been played. The Singers could have sang, but if they weren't outputted into these speakers, you would have never heard it. The same is with our faith. We are praying and playing and singing, but we don't, we're not understanding that we're not hooked up to these speakers, so no one can hear us. That's a part of it as well. So we have to understand it's always input and output. It's just not input or it's just not output, because if... If you're not going before Christ privately, then you will have nothing to give anyone publicly. 
Because all giving out simply is is when your cup running, runs over. That's the best place, the most healthy place to be when you're giving out to someone. Not when you're on empty and you're trying to give all you got. But sometimes you feel that way. And that's just life. But that's where you have to take it and say, I'm going to on purpose and be intentional to make sure privately I'm getting what I need and my cup is being filled so that I can allow it to run over. Just as we talked of last week when all the sick people were brought out and it says in the book of Acts chapter 5 that Peter went and he walked past all the sick people and even his shadow, his shadow healed people. Your shadow, God desires your shadow, your reflection, what you do, what people feel when they come around you to bring healing into people's lives. That's, he wants to transform everything about us. But are you willing to open yourself up to that process? He gives us free will, never forces anything on us. You know, the thing is, we could never imagine Jesus walking by someone who was hurting, someone who was jobless, someone who was homeless, someone who was so deep in depression. Can we all agree on that? We would never, if Jesus was here, he would never walk past someone who was hurting and struggling. Well, the tough truth is, is it happens every day happens every day because you and I are the body of Christ and we walk by people all around us or we just say, I can't deal with that today. Happens all the time. What I'm saying is we need to open up our eyes and see that God desires for us to do this and to bring healing to the broken world around us. And it might be inconvenient. It might cost you something you might have to sacrifice but for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave what was dearest and closest to him so that we could have relationship with him. Love always comes at a cost. If you know, it always comes with a cross as we talked of. I want to look at one more scripture. I'm going to leave you with this. Skipped over it. You guys got me preaching so good, I'm just blowing right through my notes. Way up. Let's see here. If I didn't write it down, I'm sharing it with you next week. Oh, here it is. 1 John 2, 6. Timmy, you should have it back there. Real simple. He who says he abides in him, which all of us say we abide in him, we ought ourselves to walk just as he walked. If we, say ab- if we abide in him, then we ought to walk just as he walked. Another quote I want to leave you with, and this is by Mother Teresa. We all know her. We all love her, the way she lived her life and the way she cared for others. It says, a sacrifice to be real must cost. It must hurt, and, must, and we must empty ourselves, give ourselves fully to God, and he will use you to accomplish great things, just as he's using you, Mike and Carol, to accomplish great things in the lives of your grandchildren. He will use you to accomplish great things on the condition that you believe much more in his love than in your weakness. That's the secret to it all. You have to see that area of weakness. You have to see, Mike and Carol, I'm using you as an example, that sometimes you don't feel that you can change another diaper or my ankle's hurting so bad today that I don't feel I can get the kids up. That's when, and this is what we all have to do in our lives, that place of weakness, we have to shift our focus off of that and look to him for strength and for power to make it through the day, to get through the day. Because at the end of it, healing was brought into the lives of your grandchildren. Healing was brought into the lives that you've chose to sacrifice for, raising your kids, doing what it takes to be a man after God's own heart, a woman after God's own heart. You know, Paul even says that for what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do that I, I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. If you go and you read Romans 7, 15 through 20, it's like, what is Paul saying here? That he desires so much to do this as we all do, but his flesh wants to rise up as it all does within us and keep us from walking just as he walked. Because we, we know and we know in this church that we're not in a playground We're in a battleground and there's evil and there's darkness that wants to keep uh, an all onslaught to come against you to keep you from walking as he walked. 
And that's where prayer comes in, in that private time where you're doing warfare. You're rebuking the devil, canceling him off of your life. So this morning, I just want you to stand, and I just want us to pray.